Arjun. Wanted to provide a part two to my Supervol mindset video that I uh, posted last week. This one with a little bit more of a focus on this question of why and or for whom and under what conditions does long-term CapEx and investments make sense? We're clearly going through ongoing period of volatility to the downside here. And that is inherently causing people to want to shorten up further their time horizons. Um, I'd argue this is the time for not everybody, but in some situations for companies to take, for investors to take a longer term focus on energy, which is clearly badly needed. Uh, Canva presentation to follow. Thank you. So a quick recap of the framework. Uh, one standard deviation move in oil today is $20 a barrel. And again, I define it as how much can oil on average move in one quarter? Uh, and I'm defining volatility relative to the historic five-year rolling average. We've generally been in a 25 to 30% vol environment. I think at least that number continues going forward. So versus a $60 oil price, which is the last five-year average, that is, at a minimum, a $20 per barrel swing in your quarterly averages. I think this is likely headed to a $25 to $30 type swing as that long-term price starts moving up to $70, $80 a barrel, even if you perhaps someday get to $100. 25% to 30% one standard deviation move in volatility, it's going to be north of a $25 to $30 swing. And if you Think about the potential for having one and a half standard deviation moves, which is hardly um, outrageous or unprecedented. You could be talking quarter to quarter, having $45 per barrel swings. Big swings in oil is something that should be expected. The equities, as we know, they're going to swing wildly with these kind of moves. Uh, and that is going to freeze many people. The instinct is going to be ratchet down, hunker down. Upsides are going to be dismissed. Downsides are going to get a little too much weight attached to them. This is the type of environment we are likely to be in. It's not dissimilar from what we had during the early 2000s super spike era, and I'll show that in a moment. I think the question will constantly be, if you're having a one to one and a half standard deviation move to the downside, how do you know it's not going to turn into a two plus standard deviation move to a trough of a cycle? And again, I've defined it as sort of a trough within 12 months, lasting for 12 months. And the reality is you don't know that, which is why points I've emphasized, having a fortress balance sheet, having good uh, competitive double digit mid-teens or better through cycle returns on capital, striving for profitability, or at least break even at the trough of the cycle. Uh, these are all the key elements to protecting one from inevitable volatility to the downside. Again, it's not a question of trying to wish it away or falling into this, we're in a structural bull market type of environment. Again, I think we are, but we still need to be cognizant of inevitable volatility, including to the downside, as we're obviously seeing at this moment. So I showed this graph in last week's video. Uh, the black line is volatility. Again, I'm going to keep repeating it. I'm defining it as the standard deviation move for the quarterly average oil price relative to the rolling historic five-year average oil price. And we, the blue line, which is on the right axis, is how many standard deviations move do you ever have in a given quarter uh, defined as sigma? So if you focus in on the, what I have circled there, which is the super spike era from the early 2000s, we were consistently in really a 30 to 40% volatility environment. No doubt the trend was decidedly to the upside from a broadly $20 long-term environment to a $100 environment, but within it, lots of ups and downs along the way. And you can see, if you look at the blue line, the sigma graphed on the right axis, the lowest move we ever had in a given quarter was one standard deviation. And we typically had north of two standard deviation moves. That idea of volatility, it is something we see in these kind of tight markets, and it is something to be ex expected, to be planned for, to not be feared. It is the reality of investing in commodity markets, including crude oil. The question is, what my plea is, how do you think long-term 
amidst all the chaos. As I've said many times, this is not an investment investment blog. It is about thinking strategically, whether you are an investor or a company or anyone else, uh, about how to think about long-term cycles, how to be a better company going forward. So we are in an environment where we have limited spare capacity, certainly on the crude oil side, seems to be true on the natural gas side. We generally have low above ground inventories. We have this climate only ESG and policy ideology while there's some signs of sort of a bending of that, a sort of a pragmatism and realism starting to creep in. Uh, we've still got a long way to go uh, before we see the world broadly recognize we're solving for energy first. We need availability, affordability, reliability, and security before you go on to secondary conditions, considerations such as climate, environment, and so forth. And I'm not trying to minimize those secondary conditions. I absolutely want to have a cleaner environment, better air and water quality, and as importantly, lower carbon emissions. But you have to get the order of operations correct. We need energy availability and affordability first. You add in the geopolitical turmoil that we've got, obviously with Russia, Ukraine, and who knows what happens going forward. We need the world to take a fresh look at old energy. This is not something that the Federal Reserve can simply print. You don't get to print barrels. You don't get to code barrels in software. It's a physical business, as we're finding out. If it does not exist, if it has not come out of the ground, if it has not reached your gas station or power plant, you don't get to use it. And the potential to not have energy is completely unacceptable to everyone, and it should be. It is, there is plenty of energy resource potential, whether it's for transportation fuels or power generation. It is a question of policymakers creating an environment that is conducive to investments. It is a question of companies and investors embracing and recognizing the need for energy investments. That is true for transportation fuels. It's true for power generation. It's a physical business. There is no chance any citizen or consumer in any country anywhere in the world ever wants to do without energy. It's not okay. And moving to unreliable forms of energy that have intermittency or other issues it's fine if that is a portion of your mix. It cannot be the entirety of your investment or policy philosophy. That is insane, as we are seeing most notably in Europe, California, and other places like that. I would ultimately implore everyone to resist short-termism. I, I get why investors have it. Many folks have investment time horizons that are less than a year, and this type of volatility is going to cause people to trade portfolio positions. I get that, right? Uh, what I get less is the policymakers who have this sort of ridiculous notion that right now all we're looking for is some short-term bridge investments before we get back on track with moving away from fossil fuels. It's absurd. The first order of business is have available, affordable, reliable, secure energy. You've got to have that. And the idea that you're just going to do some short-term things like um, browbeat OPEC for more near-term production, that, by the way, they don't really have, or that somehow shale can be the totality of our answer. I am someone who thinks, especially the Permian Basin, has a lot of potential. There are a lot of really good companies there that are going to produce oil, and it is going to grow. But there is no chance the entirety of our future supply can come from just the Permian Basin. And the same is true on natural gas and LNG. It is not just going to bubble out of the ground magically. We need the kind of environment that supports and thinks on a long-term basis, people living in reality. Here's a chart on coal demand. Uh, this goes back to 1981, so it's the last 40 years of coal. Uh, coal, of course, is overwhelmingly used for power generation. In power generation, we have lots of alternatives that you may or may not like. You can do residual fuel or diesel fuel. Generally, that's in the we prefer to not do that category. We have nuclear, uh, something I am a proponent of and um, I think is moving from out of favor to perhaps back in favor. 
but needs an investment cycle of its own. We have natural gas, we have solar, we have wind, we have a whole bunch of different things we can do, all of which are inherently less carbon emitting than coal. Yet coal demand is on track in 2022 to reach all-time new highs. So even coal, which is most out of favor in a general sense, and a, a broad agreement between policymakers, especially in the Western world, but perhaps even inc including in increasingly in, in some emerging markets, certainly in the investment community, coal has been out of favor for, you know, really since 20 years ago, since the last super cycle. Yet coal consumption continues to grow. Now, it's been a decline by and large in the UN, United States and Europe. Now, Europe, that may maybe starting to pick back up because of the recognition that you cannot rely on solar and wind for so much of your power consumption. So we're going to pick back up coal in Europe. But the big driver has, of course, been China. Uh, their significant economic progress, they've made lifting people out of poverty over the last 20 years. That has come through coal-fired power generation because it's abundant, because it's available, because it's affordable, because it's reliable. So when people talk about the risk of crude oil going away, or even more crazily, natural gas going away, coal hasn't even gone away. Coal has not gone away, people, despite the fact that no one actually likes it or really wants it. By the way, except for the people in China who have benefited from economic development. I think they may not completely hate coal, as an example. And what, what does that say about the billions of people who are still in poverty? whether it's in India or parts of Africa or other parts of Southeast Asia, or for that matter, uh, the poor people that do live in the United States and Europe. Every person on earth wants reliable, available, affordable energy. And so if we haven't even gotten rid of coal, how could it possibly be that we do not need long-term investments in crude oil and natural gas, both of which are going to be critically needed? Coal hasn't even started to decline yet. So from perhaps an investor or company perspective, why should companies think about long-term investments? Right now, the mantra is improve your returns on capital, improve your balance sheets, give out dividends, all of which I support, and nothing I'm saying suggests there should be any change to that. I'm completely in favor of strong returns on capital and shareholder payouts, which hopefully... Uh, all of you that subscribe to Super Spike appreciate at this point in time. I think the question is, do we only need short-term, let's just call it brownfield-type investments? And I would argue, perhaps for some companies, that is all we need. And I'll get to that in a moment. But, but let me start with, why do we want to think about longer-term investments? Ultimately, to have wedges, long-term wedges of production and free cash flow with minimal maintenance cap capex, that is the goal. And those wedges of free cash flow will be used for shareholder payouts, returns on capital, uh, dividends, and the potential to both sustain and grow shareholder payouts. That, that is the goal of long-term projects. In contrast to, for example, short cycle investments or shale, where you get a lot of upfront production, a big decline. And while you do have a tail, there's a constant need to invest on a short-term basis. Now, the risks to long-term investments, we all know it. It is that you don't execute on the project well, that it suffers from inflation, or, or probably worst of all, that is ultimately not an all-in low-cost project. Perhaps it gets displaced by some newer area or resource opportunity or technology in this modern age where I do think, again, energy transition will continue. Perhaps it gets displaced by something that is lower cost. Those are the risks, right? And so um, a, a few points on that. From a timing perspective, it's got to be better to pursue these projects earlier in the cycle. I mentioned this in the last video. The big problem was a lot of the long cycle CapEx didn't start till kind of 2009, 2010 and beyond. Uh, the investments happened in a very inflationary environment. Not all the projects were good to begin with. And then, of course, they all came on in the crash environment, the bust environment of 2015, 16, and so forth. That, that, that is absolutely something that should be avoided. All else equal, at a time when there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, there's, I think, a lot of, again, ideology about climate-only type philosophies, 
when shareholders and policymakers, nobody wants these projects, it's got to be a better time to at least be considering it. Considering it. From a strategy and project selection standpoint, um, it's going to be very company specific. So let's just say you're a small cap shale pure play. You're probably not the kind of company I'm talking about. Uh, those types of companies, perhaps they have growth opportunities through M&A, or perhaps some of these companies should enter blowdown mode. These types of projects are not for everyone. For the generally mid or larger size companies, I think it's going to depend on what are your core competencies, uh, what are your ability to execute, do you have the balance sheet strength, do you, have you already earned the right to spend via significantly improved returns on capital? And are the types of projects you're pursuing consistent with what you know? So again, I'm on record for being somewhat skeptical of a lot of the very large companies pursuing new energy technologies that they know nothing about. Now, maybe some will be successful. And certainly studying these areas and figure out if you can develop a core competency is something that I appreciate can make some sense. But does a project fit with what you know? Is it within your core competencies? Is it going to be at the low end of the cost curve long term? And what is your ability to execute? And I think these are all the reasons that within this very volatile environment that we're in, uh, companies, certain companies should be thinking about long-term investment opportunities that may arise. So I'll end this video on a personal note. For those of you looking for some fun summer travel ideas and you want to get some educational opportunities in, either for your children or for yourselves, I'm going to recommend a couple of petroleum museums. The one in Houston, I think it's Weiss Energy Hall within the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences, and then the Permian Basin Petroleum Museum in Midland, Texas. These are awesome places to learn about the phenomenal, interesting, and important history of the oil and gas business. And I think the only issue I have with these museums is that they're located in Houston and Midland, where there's generally already a pretty educated population about the importance of oil and gas. We need versions of these on both coasts in the U.S. and apparently in Europe as well to help educate the broader population about the important contributions oil and gas has made, whether it's us living longer, whether it's economic development, whether it's population growth. 80% plus of our energy needs today are met by some combination of oil, natural gas, and coal. And the idea that either that, that is going to change anytime soon or that you'd want it to change anytime soon is simply absurd. So if you're looking to learn about this sector and its history and all the previous times throughout the last nearly 100 years that people have been calling for the end of the age of oil, which I've highlighted in some of my publications, some of those famous economist articles, that kind of false call has existed far earlier in time and on a consistent basis. Go to these museums in Houston. Uh, if you find yourself in Midland, Texas, go visit it. Uh, these are really fun places with some terrific exhibits and will give people a better appreciation for really the critical importance of the oil and gas industry. Thank you.